Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to another exciting live session of Abbott Online. And for those who are joining us for the first time, a special welcome to you. Please refer to the chat box for more information on Abbott Learning, the work that we do, and information on our partners for the evening. Now we're excited to be well into our eighth month of online programming. As many of you know, on April 1st, we introduced our digital further learning campaign, Avid Online, and have curated and published a mix of live sessions and Avid Online videos, close to 140 programs. Uh, we've covered topics and issues from across the breadth of the arts and connected with an ever-growing online community with a wide range of local, national, and even international speakers, truly bringing the best from across the world to your screens and ensuring that even in these very difficult times, we stay true to our mantra that learning never stops. We continue to spread the positivity of the arts to uplift, educate, and inspire our community. And that brings me to our evening session, which is part of Creative Collaborations 2020, a thematized set of programming that explores perspectives on creative collaborations between art and design and looks at collaborative efforts and projects from before and during the pandemic. How artists, designers, performers, writers, and other creative individuals come together to match their synergies, respond to each other, and create. I hope you've caught some of the fascinating videos we've showcased on the topic so far. But tonight, the Kala Gura Association and Avid Learning present Design Futures, Collaboration and the New Normal. On the future trajectory of the field of design and how practitioners are working together increasingly to create, collaborate, cohesive practices. I'd like to now give a warm virtual welcome to our panelists leading architect and interior designer, Koili Kakoli, award-winning architect and interior designer, Ashish Shah, designer at IKEA and visual artist, Akanksha Deo Sharma, and they will be in conversation with our moderator for the session, columnist and author, Aparna Piramal Raje. Welcome everyone. For more about this very, very impressive panel, please refer to their bios that have been posted in the chat section. In today's session, our speakers will discuss the evolution, innovations, collaborations that have ensued particularly in the field of design. They will explore how they themselves as designers and creative individuals have shifted their practice to incorporate and embrace the digital and evaluate if collaboration holds more importance in this scenario in terms of execution, dissemination, and innovation. Please note that the session will last about 75 minutes, followed by a 15-minute Q&A in which Aparna will be taking questions. So please keep them ready. Start posting them in the Q&A box uh, throughout the session. And on that wonderful note, thank you for tuning in. Over to you, Aparna, and look forward to a fascinating session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asad. Thank you for the introduction and for the welcome. I welcome all of you to what hopes to be a really interesting discussion. So collaboration and design have always been natural, intuitive bedfellows. Um, there's something about design that promotes collaboration. In fact, um, the very famous American designer, Richard Buckminster Fuller said, a designer is an emerging synthesis of an artist inventor, mechanic, objective economist, and evolutionary strategist. When we listen to those words, we automatically think of somebody like Steve Jobs, who actually intersected so many different disciplines, right from art, design, technology, engineering, and economics to come up with revolutionary products. Today, our panelists are intersecting different design disciplines, such as textiles, furniture, architecture, interior design, and more. And we're going to hear from them as to how they did that. So I'd like to start off by inviting Kohilika to just present a little bit about her work. And we'll be sharing a little bit about each of the panelists' work before we move into the uh, moderated section of the panel. Hi, 
everyone. Thank you for having me here. I'm Kohilika. Thank you, Asar Dhanaparna, for that introduction. Um, so I, um, I by, by profession, I am uh, an architect and a carpenter. I've always had an infatuation for wood since uh, a very young, young age. So um, I actually wanted to talk to you about um, something that we've been trying to work on uh, in terms of architecture recently. So I think um, this lockdown and, and the pandemic gave at least me, not only as a human being, but also as a practicing architect, a chance to reflect on my body of work. And um, about two years ago, I was faced with a, with a problem. We were building a, a house up in the hills and we were very keen to do um, a wooden roof. It was a typical English home that we were building for someone. It was a second home for them. And uh, so we went around looking at timber construction. Um, the, one, the only examples we found were the ones that were done by the English and that was still standing. Uh, it was a real task because we were looking for glue lamp beams and uh, to be able to do that particular roof. And of course, we kind of failed miserably at that point of time because we didn't um, find the right material, the right contractor, uh, and then in the right price range. So what we started doing during this uh, pandemic, um, we took further conversations that we were having with a company called Artius, which is a Delhi-based company who has been focusing a lot and very passionate about timber uh, construction. And as you know, a lot of Europe and even uh, homes in the US and in Canada, etc., are now moving back to timber construction in a very, very big way. So uh, we've been actually, it's quite interesting because what we're doing is we're trying to build up modules where, um, because it's still quite expensive in terms of comparing it to concrete construction. So we've been trying to build up modules of what would work in different environments within India. And this is something actually that I, I'm, you know, I also want to reach out to the architectural community because you know, we are very keen that we get other people on board as well, because that's the only way this is going to become popular and big, because we've, we've realized one thing that we have to learn to be sustainable. Um, so can we go to the next slide? So these are just some visuals of the sort of things we are trying to work on, where we absolutely reduce our footprint of concrete into our construction, and we use uh, glue lamp for the columns and the beams and then different variety of woods for ceilings and floors, etc. So this is something that is very close to my heart because I, I just love wood um, and I'll get into that later on when, when we chat as well. Um, and um, so we so we're very keen and we're hoping actually we're going to have um, a mod, a very a very interesting module to be able to even put out to our other architects because there's a lot of learning behind how this construction can even take place and very different to what we I learned as an architect and the way I've been practicing at the moment. So like I said, I mean I uh, you know I have been uh, in and out of my mother's um, carpentry. Uh, workshops for since uh, since I can't even remember how old I was, and um, she had master craftsmen who worked uh, primarily with wood at that point. And I remember that my mother would come back with you know uh, she would buy original Regency Regency and Sheraton furniture, which would then be reproduced to perfect proportions, and uh, and some of them would also be repaired. So I have this passion for for furniture and. Um, we use um, a lot of different materials between metal and uh, semi-precious stones, et cetera. And this is something that we have started do. This is something that we launched actually in India Design in February and are continuing with that further till uh, February of next year. So cocoa actually is something that we came up with uh, during, I, during the lockdown and during COVID, which is going to be our new arm of furniture under the head of K2 India. So this is one of our internal collaborations that we're quite excited about doing. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? So again, this is just to show you how we take materials and this is a, this is a particular veneer which we brush down and we open the grains of it and it has this beautiful texture that comes out of it. And we use it in different ways. These, of course, on the left is a, is, um, is a take from a Biedermeier style, but a modern take of it. And on the right is a desk, again, a take of a Biedermeier style and then incorporated into a modern style. 
Um, we are also very excited to say that you know, we, are, we are starting with two very established brands, a factory outlet. Um, and we are super, super excited about that because we find over, this, over the time of COVID, we've had a lot of people coming in to just redo one room or redo you know, three pieces of furniture. And um, we're, we're keen to get out there and be able to provide solutions for these people because more and more people are entertaining at home now since all of us seem to be, our lives between professional and domestic seem to be completely disappearing. Uh, can we go to the next one, please? So this is something uh, I've been collaborating with uh, a company called ThreadArt. There are two designers, Gunjan Arora and Rahul Jain, and we've been working on it since much before COVID. And uh, you know, we've been, they work beautifully with thread and they, 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 they have this technique of even molding with thread where they stiffen it by either using resin or steel wires. And we've been using it as either, uh, uh, we, we can't be inventive about how we use it, not just as installation, but also as partitions in rooms where we want to have the feeling of open space. Uh, could we go to the next image, please? versus also using it as art. And as you can see here, it's, um, it's, it's being stiffened. And now what we are doing is together, which we've started working on, in fact, in June of this year, is we're doing a series of 13 pieces of furniture, which are going to be highly exclusive, um, where we're gonna be using their technique of how they use thread and how they stiffen it into these 13 pieces of furniture that we will be launching in March of next year. So yes, that's that's what I have been up to. There are lots of questions I'd like to ask you, so we'll save those for later. But thank you for sharing that. And Akanksha, could we have you up now? Hi everyone, and thanks Aparna for the introduction. Uh, my name is Akanksha, and I am working as a designer for IKEA, and I'm an artist as well. And yeah, I would uh, like to share some of the work that we have done. We I'm I'm based in Delhi right now, and uh, as we know, like the air quality is pretty bad here. So um, the best way to start this presentation is with the latest collection that we have done. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this collection is called Forendering. And uh, this has been done as part of a better air initiative that IKEA has started in uh, 2018. And the main purpose of this collection was actually to um, highlight the rice straw residue that we have in North India that we traditionally burn and to really look at that waste as a um, new renewable resource for IKEA and its future products and to really do a test run on look, you know, looking at the problem, looking at what we could do and to really experiment with the material itself and uh, explore a lot of techniques. So here you can see it's like a collection of homeware products ranging from you know, rugs and runners to baskets and lampshades to bowls and storage. And um, the main purpose of this collection was to really communicate the idea of um, to start looking at what's around us rather than creating something from like virgin materials. And this is a very big issue in India at this time of the year. I mean, we can see it right now. And this was, you know, part of the small initiative to understand the chain and why is this problem there and to kind of be part of that change in a small way. And, um, and right now it's currently actually launched in IKEA India store. Uh, and it will be launched in uh, four or five other markets globally uh, next year. So of course, like due, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, the sales start of this collection has also been pushed due to the, you know, breaking of the supply chains. Uh, but, um, you know, finally it's going to come out and I think um, it's, a, it's a great way to kind of also encourage smaller businesses and like smaller startups and like innovation houses to start looking into new materials because I think circularity and sustainability, like Koelika also said, is something that we cannot just overlook and we need to start, in a, you know, working towards more innovative materials to solve this problem. Um, 
and yeah i mean the color story you know we want it to be as accessible and understandable as possible so it's been like shades of gray and blue to denote like the present situation that we have here and what we aspire to have like a clear blue sky so so yeah this was uh, our latest collection that's been going on um and if we can go to the next slide please Yeah so um this project was also very special for me I did it right um at the end of last year which was November December and this has been a collaboration uh, with me and um uh, a like you know design research uh, space lab called Space 10 that's based in Copenhagen and I basically have designed the space installation for them when they were launching in Delhi for 6 7 months and um the whole idea of this installation was to really question why why are we doing this and what's the purpose again of doing something like this and to really understand what's the feeling and emotion uh that you want uh people to feel when they enter this space and that feeling was uh because the space was so expansive uh i wanted you know the space to feel more comfortable and and welcoming but also kind of evocative of curiosity to like learn more and like to you know really grow and uh absorb and share ideas in that space and um and of course like you know i could have worked with any material and uh here i just thought that you know what's a better way to actually use uh, reclaimed fabrics so this installation is basically six fabrics uh, six panels that's made with reclaimed fabric in further collaboration with an indian uh, design label called 1111 and uh, the whole idea for me is i think it's very important to collaborate at at all levels and uh, if i was kind of sourcing these fabrics and then i was just like thinking uh you know who better to kind of contact some homegrown brands who are already working with like so many beautiful textiles and techniques and 1111 does wonderful work with their textiles and they you know everybody has some kind of um you know uh, leftovers um so this was quite a nice collaboration between three uh three teams like um, me and the space ten people that kind of really helped me understand what they wanted and to also reflect their values but also highlight the beautiful crafts that's been done by brands like 1111 so um so yeah this was that and if we can go to the next slide um yeah so this this project has again uh been very um special but also very intimate i would say uh this is currently uh, running globally at all ikea stores um they're basically essentially two cushion covers but it's 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 like a new strategy to kind of introduce uh like you know handcrafted products uh, to a worldwide audience at a global level usually before when we have designed collections highlighting the handcrafted value it has been like smaller collections which would be you know 35000 pieces but with this because we didn't really expand the product range but just focused on two simple items like articles and we were able to scale up like you know now they are being made in like uh, 200000 pieces each so what we achieve with that is um, you know we scale up we actually get the cost down and then we kind of make it more accessible to as many people as we can and um what happens with that is it's kind of very directly helping the people which we, who are like at the forefront of this project which is you know these uh, amazing women in bikaner that i've been working with and the main purpose is to kind of provide them livelihood and employment and to actually give them stability and consistency in their work so when we increase when we scale up these products what happens is the production time also increases and with that what happens is the people feel more secure to do the same thing for a longer period of time and that's i think the most important part 
here because it was a collaboration uh, with these women directly. And um, so, so as a designer, you have to really understand not what you want to make, but to really understand the problem at hand and like how they feel doing something. Is it, is it an easy design? Is it a simple design or is it a difficult design for them to comprehend? Do they even enjoy uh, embroidering, you know, and what they like? Um, so it was really at the forefront. And, and what happened is that uh, now this has launched and we have done a second round of um, cushion covers that will launch in 2021. Um, 2021 and 2022 and um, and there I couldn't go and meet these ladies because it was such an intimate relationship with them. I couldn't do it anymore due to the pandemic. And then we had to just like digitally brainstorm and digitally communicate newer ideas. But what happened is because I met them once, they already understood me a lot and I really understood their capabilities. So it worked really uh, well actually across the digital platforms. So yeah, and then if you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, actually a two year old project, uh, but I think uh, it's quite a nice one to put here because um, this collection is called Engla Torar and it's, um, it's it was the first collection, a contemporary collection that we designed just for India. So we made it in India and for India. When the first IKEA India store was launching, they gave us, they gave the two designers a brief. The one designer is Swedish and one was me. Uh, I'm Indian. And the whole brief was to actually think of uh, trying to, you know, how can we conceive and amalgamate the two cultures together to, to show respect to, to, you know, honor India as a market, but also like the work that we've been doing uh, with our Indian suppliers and craftsmen for such a long time. And uh, this was a very a different kind of collaboration, I would say, because uh, we, we both of us, Pauline, the designer and me, we, we really had to think of our cultures and and we had to really discuss like literature uh, practices the way we live the way we are different and the way we are similar and at the end of it we kind of realized that we we're like we're coming from such different cultures and backgrounds however there's just like those core values and principles that were just so same and and that i think um in fact became the crux of this collection which was um, finding like one binding symbol that kind of unites us. And, and here we kind of, you know, broke down Hindi and uh, the Swedish language and we kind of really played around, deconstructed the alphabets, letters, the phonetics, the sound of some words um, to just create uh, something that, that's not like quite decipherable, but uh, it's just like another language of symbols that became like, our uh, most iconic pattern for this collection. Um, yeah, and um, then we can go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, and this is uh, the last uh, project for this slide. And um, this was actually a collaboration with an art agency called Art and Found and Smile Foundation. And they basically approached me to create an artwork that could uh, be given for charity for their campaign called Artwork for Hard Work. And it was mainly to, you know, uh, help the essential workers. And here, um, you know, I'm trying to denote the grains of rice here. It's uh, a thread work on uh, canvas. And um, it's basically to question our existing systems and how how you know we have realized the future is so uncertain and uh, our supply chains have broken uh, have been broken and so it's more to kind of question how can we build more sustainable circular and um, you know long lasting systems that can help like you know the people working in these supply chains uh, without 
without going through these uh, moments of crisis. So it's to really look at building more resilient food supply systems. Um, yeah, and it's called the Common Thread. It was made this year. Great. Thank and, you, Arnanda. Um, That's yeah, really, nice really interesting work. Thank you for sharing those. And we'll Thank come you. back to you with some questions. Um, Ashish, could we have you on? Hi guys, thank you for having me. Um, thanks, Asad. Thanks, Aparna. Hi, Kanksha. Hi, Koilika. Um, um, so, I would like to start with this presentation talking about what I actually did through the lockdown. And I think it was a really tough time for me because I live by myself. And um, when you live by yourself and your thoughts are all that you have in a closed box environment, that channeling that thought was really difficult for me initially and then I think I found a way to put that uh, actually I contracted COVID way earlier and then uh, during that period of my COVID infection I started drawing as therapy and that went into uh, another tangent altogether where I started doing a lot of sketches through meditation um, I'm not showing that here but that is actually being the core core of everything that I've been doing right now and post COVID for me to start this conversation. Um, we can go to the next slide and um, we can, um, yeah, we start with this uh, restaurant that we just finished in Mumbai, BKC. It's called Sequel and we um, designed this, finished the design uh, of this restaurant in March and we started work on this restaurant physically on site mid-March. Um, so actually we managed to kind of do this project through the entire eight months of COVID and we just handed it over a month ago. So that I thought it'd be interesting to start through this because being an interior designer architect, this is what our lives are to be able to work on site and finish projects. So if you go on to the next slide, um, a little bit about this restaurant. Um, it's a very, very, um, very interesting restaurant for one reason because it's completely organic and vegan and it's a plant-based menu where they believe in um, healthy living through healthy eating um, so uh, there's a lot of color in their food so what happens is that when you get anything that they serve you there's always a burst of it's almost spring on your plate and when I when I first tasted their food it was just about produce and when we started designing this restaurant, I was very clear that I wanted the space to be extremely monochromatic because that would be the only way you could actually enjoy the food because it's a visual medium as well, apart from your taste, taste and smell. So we started with this restaurant in two different spaces. One is the more cafe day to day and the other is a fine dine section. So you see the first image on your left is where you're sitting in the fine dine and looking at the um, at the cafe side of it, where uh, we have this uh, amazing uh, guy working on the brick flooring that we wanted to kind of uh, bring into the restaurant because we wanted to kind of feel, make you feel that you're in a middle of a courtyard somewhere. Um, also, it is important to kind of give you context. BKC is um, this part of Mumbai, which is a very, very... Um, new area it's completely redeveloped and it's it's man-made and fully steel and glass so it's extremely extremely cold as a space you can hardly see 10 trees in that area so it's very very cold so we wanted to bring in a lot of uh, earthy and uh, earthy material so you felt more um, to the ground with, with this space and yeah so we can go to the next slide and so this is the fine dine section where, you know, we wanted to work with a lot of craft based um, um, practices. Uh, for example, one of the crafts that I work very closely with is Channapatna in Karnataka, which is a toy making village where I make these wooden beads that you see, which we call manka. Um, and we made this kind of a light that kind of circumvents and it's an extension of my meditation drawings and it kind of just hovers over your seating and kind of gives you a soft glow wherever you're seated. And um, through a very interesting uh, uh, part of this restaurant is through the whole lockdown, we realized that we'll have to kind of figure out a way that people don't face each other. So although the 
layout was different we ended up lay, laying these sofas you know you know in a way different way eventually where all the back space are, are are put together in one direction so everyone looks the other side so this was something that happened through covid and it was interesting to see how it worked out quite uh, quite quite well actually it kind of works very interesting so now when i go and sit there and eat i actually find it very convenient because you actually are in the in the space but you have your own corners so yeah this is one of the, we can go to the next slide this is another space that i did uh, two years ago for my dear friend sanjay gar in mumbai and this was his first uh, retail store before this he he used to operate from this farm in delhi which was partly home partly workshop partly design studio partly store so this was his first outpost as a, a retail uh, retail store and we found this beautiful location behind the taj mahal hotel in kolaba um, next to the good earth store uh, in a in a very beautiful courtyard um and um, uh, it used to be this other store called bombay electric which was also it's actually one of my favorite stores at that point uh, till it shut and um, i was very nervous because uh, the store was beautifully designed i don't know if anyone's been to bombay electric you 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 know um, priya had done such a great job about with the aesthetic of that place from the merchandising to the interiors so it was a it's a tough challenge to kind of overcome that and so when we started ideating we were like yes we need to make sure that we bring a little bit of delhi farmhouse into the space but we also use a lot of indian crafts and indian materials and indian kind of aesthetic of minimalism through it so we went on to the search of what is indian minimalism and then uh, obviously came in gandhi's philosophies um, sabarmati ashram so we took a lot from all of those kind of spaces and started looking at lines and how we can use lines to create um uh, to create a language with materiality so if you go to the next slide you you be able to see um yeah so you can see here so on one side i'll start with the right image which is on the ground floor um the, there there were these metal columns and we had an initial idea of kind of uh, encasing them with wood or you know any of softer materials but then eventually we decided to kind of expose them and leave the architecture of the time um we are extremely prevalent but we also took a call of not putting any mannequins in the shop so everything that you see is behind closed doors and you felt like you went into one of these old uh, sari shops in amdabad where you could sit on the floor and just uh, you know the lady of the house would bring piles to you and you could shop that way so uh, and then sanjay uh, um, so we made these glass shutters which would slide open uh, slide and fold open and then sanjay designed this beautiful fabric that went behind it that get gave you a bit of a reveal but didn't expose the bare immediately um the the desk that you, the cash desk that you see there is kind of my signature which is this uh, copper with a brass box that i do everywhere which is almost floating and in this one what we try to do is i was um, uh, we were, we went on an excursion to um sanjay and we went on an excursion to chor bazaar which is this kind of a free market in mumbai um and we found these brass burnies which used to store uh, you know nashta and like um, like mithai in, in olden days and there used to also be these pateris which you which the munim or the or the merchant or the money uh, money accountant in your store would have to put loose change in so we use those details to kind of reveal on the top and create this brass box as a money box in the center of the space which kind of floats and holds the space together on the on the left you see another image which is the used to be a back office space for bombay electric on the mezzanine floor of of the same building and sanjay kind of inherited the space by default so what we did is we um, it used to it used to have, it didn't have any of these kind of windows or the ceiling so we brought in the heritage by looking at the windows across the building uh, through the courtyard and we found the same details on that building we we incorporated these windows there and then i kind of added these wooden rafters um uh, to create the feeling of old architecture within the space so I, I, the play of light and shadow became extremely important and we kind of just made it all white so that was a um, that was this idea of collaboration and i think my conversations with sanjay and my conversation and my my reading about gandhi kind of brought in a lot in the design story of this um this uh, this journey 
um, we also designed everything from the tables and the chairs and everything was designed. In fact, the tables, uh, things that I picked up on the, um, you know, while driving through the streets of Delhi while visiting Sanjay's store. And, you know, they kind of have these people on the streets selling ladders and tables that they make locally in front of their farms and they just put it up on the road for you to buy. And then we just painted them black on the top and left these uh, seaweed mats below. So if you go next, uh, the next slide. Um, so here is an example of, you can go to the next slide, example of a, an apartment that we did in Mumbai where we kind of had so much fun with the client. Um, and this was a different kind of a collaboration because um, the client became my kind of a collaborator in a way because she was interested in art, she was interested in design, she was interested in crafts. So we started working with different um, different people to, to finish this house and we wanted to add a lot of vibrancy and color through it. Um, so you can see we worked with different artists like Subodh and Talur and, um, you know, and even younger artists uh, from the country um, to create a kind of a atmosphere of Indian contemporary um, kind of gallery space in a way. And then we, 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 we found these beautiful pieces of uh, vintage furniture like Poyer and um, you know some unknown but really interesting art deco designers uh, from flea markets around the world to create this kind of an atmosphere of um, uh, and a handwriting of uh, what is contemporary design for me. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Yeah, so here you can see how we kind of brought in a little bit of even traditional Indian um, you know, stone inlay in the flooring, but then played it off with uh, geometry. So if you see on the left, uh, there's one geometry on the floor, which is like a larger piece of um, uh, floor inlay, which is inspired by a palace in uh, Jaipur. And then on, on, uh, 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 right on that is a console that we picked up again in Jaipur, which is kind of a bone inlay and resin, which is very common, uh, but it kind of, kind of resonates very beautifully with the floor. And then we had this contemporary work which the clients just had happened to have and we kind of put it together and kind of the dimensions worked beautifully. The geometry worked very, very in proportion with lines that we wanted to give as a central axis. Um, and on the other side is a staircase that I designed, which because this, this penthouse was on the ocean, we wanted to create like an aquatic mammal that kind of connects the two floors. Um, so it kind of runs, um, uh, runs its own course and kind of goes up and down and moves a very organic uh, way, it's almost like a like a body, like a, like anatomy. And then the base of it, we wanted to put a a, a kind of uh, very a very kind of imposing sculpture. And then we found this beautiful head by uh, Reddy, and we kind of um, had 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 him, had a sit there. Um, can you go to the next slide? Ashish, just in the interest of time, could I ask you to move a little bit faster, if that's okay? Sure. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, this is a, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so this is a collaboration that I did with Urban Ladder, I think a couple of years ago, uh, where we wanted to um, revive the idea of cane work in contemporary furniture. And we work with lots of local craftsmen all over the country because that's how they work and um, followed my language of the lingam geometry here again. So I'm just going to move fast with this as well and go to the next slide. Um, this is another collection that we did with as a collaboration with Cocoon Fine Rugs. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, uh, where we wanted to look at the brisole uh, of Corbusier's uh, buildings at the Capitol complex in Chandigarh and kind of have them become a pattern of um, light and shadow. And then we work with different with silk and wool threads to create these carpets. If you go to the next slide, uh, Moon Shadow is another um, craft that we work with. It's called Lompi, and Lompi is is a craft. It's a terracotta, black terracotta pottery from uh, Manipur, where we work for the first time with them to be able to change the dimensions of this craft. So why I put this slide is because before these bases were actually made, um, they had never been able to go beyond 12 inches of depth and size and height. Uh, and we actually worked eight months with them with uh, um, technical knowledge from, uh, from our uh, international potters to be able to give them the capacity to move to a height of about three feet now. 
So we try to change the craft after generations to be able to now start making these in a different scale. So they're very excited to work on it. And for them now we're working a lot more with them on newer products. Um, uh, go next, please. I think the last one is something that we started as a group of architects during um, uh, during the COVID time, which is known as the India Design Fund, where we had about 80 different designers pool in together and give products and collaborate. And, um, um, and we did a phenomenal sale, which did really well, thanks to Story Limited and all my collaborators and my curators. I would love to name them, name them Iram Sultan, um, uh, Vinita Chaitanya, um, uh, Parina Thapar, Shimur Khadri, um, so to name them. And we, we, we all got together and we decided to kind of help the people who really needed it to craft villages and people from my industry. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Ashish. That's a really diverse portfolio. I mean, everything from doing, you know, working with craftspeople in smaller settings to working at a large scale of doing these huge homes and, uh, you know, these very, um, very specific kind of restaurants. So sequel is one of my favorites, actually. So it was nice. Oh, great. Thank I'm you. I'm looking forward. I'm, look, I, I'm looking forward to the fine dining version of it. So that should you be You must. Fun. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so let's move into a few questions. Um, let's start, Koilika, with you. You said that um, you have collaborated with a timber construction firm. You want to put together an architect's community. And of course, you collaborate all the time with your mother, who I think is on the call with us. So how are these three different? What is the nature and shape of these how, how do they vary? And how has the pandemic affected all of these? So, um, <clears throat> you know, I, um, I was very luckily um, because I had an education in America and uh, collaboration, I think, came into India uh, much later. I think the West took it on much more easily. And uh, it's and and. I've been collaborating ever since I moved back to India because one of the projects I worked on was um, I was working in Norman Foster's office and he was collaborating on uh, the Boston Fine Arts Museum with um, IMP. So um, ever since I moved back, one has always believed that, um, you know, one person can bring a certain amount to the table and there's a lot to learn when people come together to do it. In fact, my my biggest collaboration with my own mother was last year when we were asked to curate a design fair called uh, DX by Times of India. And I think it was for the first time, now it's been done, but it was for the first time where we had architects come in to design the spaces of the uh, vendors and people who were producing products. Um, and they set the space for that product at that fair. Um, so it was a it was a collaboration between a whole bunch of architects and different vendors that came together at at DX. Uh, but what I'm really most excited about working in terms of at least because you know I I work on two different scales all the time being an architect and then being a carpenter. But on an architectural front, um, what we are trying to do is because timber construction is so new to India, um, or to I should say to modern India. Um, that we are trying to make it simpler because there's a lot of even you don't even find structural en engineers who truly understand how to do structure with timber. So we are trying to break these modules down with RTS and um, some friends of ours in Canada who've been helping us. And we did this beautiful trip to Vancouver and Whistler two years ago uh, with RTS, um, where we'll have set modules for people to be able to not just make residential homes, you know. Uh, something which is very popular and Ashish will probably also agree with this one is that we are always being asked to also do add-ons to homes that are already existing, especially in Delhi. You know, families are growing and especially with farmhouses and more and more restrictions with construction, timber becomes a great uh, source for us to use uh, because it's, it's light, it's quick, it can all be done. You know, we're talking about technology, it can all be prefabricated, brought to site. And in times like the pandemic, where you have to reduce your footfall of labor on a site, it is a beautiful and a very functional way, not besides the fact that it is much better for the environment. Uh, so, you know, one is very, very excited about uh, 
working with this. But like I said, we're going to have to reach out to a lot of architects to come on board to make this popular in India. So Ashish, I'm counting on you for that one, by the way. So this is kind of like an innovative, um, I mean, this is sort of coming to you intuitively, the idea of reaching out to a community, right? Yes, you know, I, I have, it's something that one has um, always done with one's work very early on. I don't want to talk too much about me because, you know, I, I there is this, I, I never joined my mother. Nobody knows that, that, you know, I never actually... Uh, came back from America and joined my mother's company. I actually started on a completely different tangent on my own and did my own thing for five years. And K2 India as a baby, we established in 2010. So, um, and the way I managed to get work at that point was not collaborating with my mother because I didn't want to be known as her daughter, but actually doing collaborations with many other young people who were around who were also trying to, you know, get their feet grounded in India. Um, this, and 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 it's something that actually comes relatively easy yeah, easily to me and i always um, you know we've been talking about even akanksha was talking about reaching out to people who are already very creative in the form of design that they're working on and the material that they're working in because there's no point for each one of us to reinvent the wheel there really is no need to do that you know we i think we all have to bring our set of skills to the table and then we have to figure out how to integrate them to, together to make something beautiful um and not worry about our own personal footprint all the time because you know there's this there's also this obsession with people leaving i'm sorry to say this but there is this obsession of architects also leaving their own particular footprint behind you know as they get older and older. And I think that is something we need to move away from and, you know, come together as a community and do things together, which is not singular. It's not a single brand to it. Yeah. And, and how does that compare with your mother? Is it also that kind of partnership where you bring different things to the table? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, most recently, um, I, I just finished doing her home. And she's, and you know, it's, 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 it's a big laugh with my friends because she's been my toughest client. And uh, but I just finished doing a home which I designed, but it was completely styled by her. But uh, and I say toughest because she was, you know, she kept saying that I want you to do it, and I I, I want no say in it. And she wouldn't even decide on a, on a fabric color. So I literally had to do everything. It was like you know, it was like designing for a client who was uh, in in a way like Ashish was locked into his house. My mother was locked into a house and didn't want to contribute. She's just like you do it, you know. So. But, uh, but, you know, collaborating, again, my mother and I bring, you know, my mother didn't study architecture. My mother studied English literature. And she comes from a very different um, thought, whereas I'm a lot more technical. She's, she brings in something very different to the table. So the projects that we work on together, I have to say I'm very proud of uh, because they come, they, they, it's a very nice synergy between um, tradition, culture, uh, and what is modern and more functional today. And so is the pandemic uh, infusing more creativity or is it sort of detracting from your ability to work with people? You know, I, like Ashish, I think I've had a, a, a also a bit of a tough time during, it was quite an adjustment during COVID. And, and you know, we are people who, uh, and I'm sure Kangsha will agree to this, you know, it's, it's a very right touch and feel profession. You know, you have to, whether it's material, sight, you want to touch and feel and you know, and, and, and experiment and sample and all that. So it was quite, uh, it was quite complicated. But I had, but like I said, when we started this conversation, at some point you halted, and at least I did. And I looked back and, and, and I said, you know, what am I as a human being and, and who am I as a human being and what am I as, a, as an architect and, and a carpenter? And I, and I started reflecting back on my own body of work and figuring out how I want to change it and what the current environment is requiring you know we we went in and built these so we've of course we've had we've had uh, ateliers and workshops for years and years now but what we started doing is we built these we, we we now have three we built these three mini workshops because we used to have over 120 people come in because we are very we are very ha we we are a craft carpentry workshop which means that we work with master craftsmen there's very little machinery which is used in our factories unless it is for you know wardrobes and vanities and certain things so we had a, we had a lot of dealing a lot of issues having to deal with labor and so we've now gone in and set up these three little like mini workshops where 
we have a subcontractor who's working there who responds so and, and luckily technology has helped us because we've all kind of set them up with you know zoom and skype and things like that but it's been you know you evolve i mean i mean human beings evolve so we so we've adjusted and we've evolved evolved and we try to do the best that we can but i have to say um I I do I did miss going to site and being I I think it's amazing that you know it, we we've designed two projects during covid as well where we barely been to site and I'm doing a home right now for a client who's sitting in London and obviously they can't come and that's another challenge where you feel oh my god you know you kind of doing this whole project but the client can't come and walk through the space but yet we're moving forward so we adjust you know and and luckily good clients trust us and you know we move forward well that's an honest response thank you for that uh akanksha what was really interesting to me about what you said was that um you know how strategic the whole collaboration was so whether it was about the having you know sustainability as a priority whether it was about having social entrepreneurship as a priority so how do you as a designer feel about that does it do you look at it as a kind of uh, do you embrace the mission or do you feel that in some way it it gives you definition or does it make it harder the project um yeah i mean you know so i i have actually studied fashion in delhi and not so long ago like i just graduated 4 uh, years ago in fact so uh, coming from fashion background and then straight away going to ikea i think uh i certainly have um, you know my learning as a designer is certainly shaping while working for one of the biggest companies who have a very like strong idea about how they want to you know uh, work with their different partners and what kind of products they should make and and for us uh, you know um circularity has become like one of the key um like key uh, missions to like you know achieve by 2030 so it's it's not something like i would say that in today's world like the designer cannot just exist and do what they as they please like they need to really understand the you know the objective and like the reason of doing something why are you choosing that material or why are you highlighting that craft or like why are you mixing three materials together in a small product is that even beneficial or is that you know like to think of how do you deconstruct that product after it has lived how can you design things that can live for a longer period of time um so all those aspects of like uh, th- through like thinking through and through about like you know uh, does it make sense to like combine plastic with metal for example or should we just make something with one material so that you know it's more circular it can at least then go into recycling as one object not like uh deconstructing different parts then it's almost impossible so it's i would say it's uh it's not a choice it's something that we all need to work with like whether it be um working in collaboration with people with the craftsmen how how do you work with them like how do you treat them fairly and um how do you um uh, you know use materials and how do you make the products and you know all those aspects are kind of crucial to begin with in today's world when we are just uh, living in a, in a world with the depleting resources so um i would say it 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 can only make you stronger as a designer it can only make you sharper and clearer like what objective are you kind of um you know sufficing here um so for me it has been really a very different way to understand design because we are also talking about mass production here i'm um, we are not like so yeah at least for ikea when i work we are not thinking about um small scale but it's really large scale and that just changes the game like you then really need to think of uh, different uh, aspects of designing that product so um yeah and um it it must also influence your thinking as a visual artist right and the kind of projects that you've taken i mean it was, it was interesting to me that you selected to show us the one with the grains of rice which which also had a very kind of strategic underpinning to it yeah of course i mean uh, you know it's uh, uh, you can of course um 
express yourself or like express another part of yourself through maybe your art uh, but the approach that you have as a creative person still remains the same and your understanding of like you know um how how you like so i worked a lot with handcraft and um you know like i've kind of um explored a lot of um like during my college i worked a lot with block printers in gujarat and kutch so uh, apart from that i've also worked with different techniques like bandhni and um different kind of embroideries so like when i work for ikea i'm trying to integrate that beauty of handcraft in a mass production setting but also when i do my art it's it's almost to like make use of like what is available in our different clusters and to really enhance and to really uh highlight those uh, beautiful techniques and the people and the stories behind you know those thing uh, those techniques and uh, crafts through your work so mm -hmm. so yeah i mean yeah it it definitely kind of it's like a ping pong you kind of just uh, switch yeah that's a nice balance to have and it's a nice synergy between left hand and right hand to have that yeah for sure for sure but how is the pandemic affecting all of this how are you resetting your priorities um for your work yeah so uh, like uh, like ashish and koilika like i had a really tough time uh, uh even though i'm you know not running my own studio i'm working for a company even then it was just so hard for me because um like last year i actually traveled uh, quite some days like 200 days out of 365 like my work is entirely based on like you said like feeling touching going to the factories building uh, on the factory floor meeting meeting the different craft craft clusters or like visiting homes of people across like all over the world and like then attending like workshops and events so it it's just like uh, from that life to this year where i have just made one trip i think international when i was uh, at a supplier in china for a lighting project and uh, that was in feb and since then like i've just been working from home and and like koilika also said that you know uh, it may not be the perfect thing that you want as a designer but you kind of evolve and you adapt and that's i think the crux of this period whether it be small businesses or whether it be medium sized companies or whether it be just you as an individual uh, the sooner you uh, you know uh, adapt and realize that this will last longer uh, the sooner you adapt the better it is and the more likely you will survive uh, also so for us i've been developing everything uh, digitally right now we have like very like digital brainstorming tools like miro we're trying to like find newer ways of like communicating with like say the ladies in bikaner or like some craft uh, embroidery ladies in jordan and then some ceramists in thailand and you know they're teaching me how to make how to make like a cup or a bowl online like ideally i would have gone to like doi tung in thailand to just learn that at the factory but here they were like teaching me everything online and it's like there's an ipad there's a laptop then he's calling me and it's like all happening at the same time it's kind of fascinating because it does work but again you miss that real realness of it so i i feel like it has to be balanced with the digital needs to be balanced with the physical when things get a little bit different in the future mm. so yeah mm. okay thank you thank so you. Ashish uh, I forgot to say I was uh, sorry to hear that you tested positive also and that I hope you made a full recovery now so maybe you could just tell us a little bit about these meditative practices that you had in terms of drawing and sketching you, you, you I know you didn't say you had images but just tell us what it was like yeah. the process So Prana I've been uh, drawing for now 20 years and uh, there's something known as the axis mundi drawings that I do which is um I mean, I have to show it to you because they're they're very fine and they're they're like a pencil drawing that it starts at one point and it it's a never-ending line because it kind of the the whole idea of axis mundi is the center of the earth connecting to the center of the universe and it's a line that never ends and so it's kind of a meditative line that kind of goes back and forth, back and forth in an oval form, um, almost like an ovular form to create this almost like a thumbnail impression on the page and then from that I develop forms. 
that become part of my uh, product uh, practice and my design pra object practice actually not product um, and um, apart from that i do i use the oval which is the shibling form as a geometry to do a lot of different kind of drawings and watercolors and so there's one pattern that i've been working on which is now um, i think next month launching with westelm as a range of carpets um, and cushions uh, but other than that through the pandemic i did i i expanded that that language much more you know so for 20 years i've been doing just two to three styles and then suddenly in the pandemic now i have got like some six different styles that it's it's expanded and burst out and you know so i think i needed that pause to be able to kind of explore that practice of my my journey uh, which i had almost kind of become repetitive with mm. so i did these kind of light drawings and these drawings that kind of explore just the form and light and it kind of evolved into different forms and some i don't know it became more organic that's interesting and um, you mentioned you talked a lot about workshops and craftsmanship so um what is the future of these post the pandemic and how do you make the collaboration what is it about workshops that make themselves so amenable to collaboration to begin so, with uh, how do you sustain them after the pandemic so yeah it's a very interesting question but i think the bigger question right now that uh, anyone who's working with craft villages will know is that there is a lot of existing stock available right now within the village with environment um which is a at least a two year of dead stock and if we don't consume that as 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 a country or we you know um they they are going to have a lot of um, economic um issues in that in those areas so what we're trying to do right now is work with what they have existing interest try to modify them and add value in our own design practices to be able to consume that product so currently at my collaborations with villages is not to explore new forms and new objects but to actually consume what they already have because i think that's a bigger bigger stress otherwise they will have to um, literally they they won't have money to survive so i think that's a bigger concern at this point and most villages are going through that some villages have actually been able to sell off a lot through covid uh, and diwali has been great for them because you know uh, a lot of people have been very sensitive to be to be gifting village products you know as diwali but uh, there are a lot of um, villages down south that need a lot of help so we're working with them but workshop otherwise workshops with with uh, workshops with um, villages is very important because um, they need to understand your language so like how akanksha said that you know she would work with these women in bikaner and um kind of start the only way to work with them is first understand them and then you give your opinion because the moment you give your opinion to them it, there is a sense of intimidation so i think the first thing what we try to do is kind of uh, make them feel that we are here to learn from them rather than teach them so it's it's something that we learned over time say uh, that you know we have to go uh slightly more humble towards them so those workshops are basically us uh, acclimatizing ourselves with their temperaments and then through that we've been able to create so much because of just like telling them to push themselves because for example I, the reason why i showed the lompi raises is it's the prime example of us trying first of all the northeast is extremely extremely averse to working with us uh because they feel that we are always out to cheat them uh for some reason especially coming from cities like mumbai um and they feel we're extremely commercially minded which probably we are we unknowingly uh but i think uh the the way we work with them is first try to make them feel that we are not here to kind of uh damage their, their what they're working on we're just kind of adding value to uh to move things in different directions so i don't know if that answers the question but i was trying to kind of come to the question uh, answer of seeing how uh, collaborations work in a different setup you know and i think akanksha actually um articulated it better than me when she kind of had that whole moment of her uh, being able to give them a livelihood for a longer period of time by just kind of um uh, creating the value numbers for them and giving them more confidence in her practice yeah but it's nice and it's nice that you uh, outline some of the attributes that are needed on on behalf of a designer um in terms of your humility also um so so that's that's interesting so a question for all um three of you 
is how is technology playing out? You've already referred to it, but how is it playing out? Should I all- go for it? Yeah, go for it. So I'm hating it. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> technology. I have. No, I don't want to do anything to with it. I. Um, that's why back in office, and I'm trying to get everybody back to office because this is all I can do. Um, this this iPad, phone, <laughs> laptop, which Akanksha has been talking about. For me, it's very difficult. I'm very tactile as a human. I need to touch, feel, meet, hug, uh, you know, talk face to face with less than six feet distance to be able to survive this design world. Uh, but uh, as even Kohilika said that, you know, it's been tough for them to be able to work with carpenters and, you know, their master craftsmen to bring them back and to give them the spirit. Uh, but I think it's high time we all get back to it because technology is one. And I think we've all maxed out the potential of it. Uh, these talks, I wish now, Asad, we can start uh, hopefully in 2021 meeting and having them back at the NGMAs and the different venues, the amazing venues that you host in. Um, but for me, I'm actually done with technology and I don't want to see more of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else who wants, Akanksha, you're on the screen, so. Yeah, I mean, um, I I don't maybe think as uh, extreme like Ashish, but uh, for sure, I think people are struggling in their own ways, but um, I think that it will stay and it will even get further and further advanced. So I think people have just suddenly realized that half of the meetings you can just do on, you know, Zoom and Teams. So they don't really have to meet anybody. And so it, it of course, brings like its own challenges, pros and cons of being in a family, having kids around or, or really enjoying it, like really enjoying not having to meet anybody. So, um, but I think... Um, it will stay and it will kind of also further evolve as much as maybe some of us hate it or some of us maybe struggling with it. Um, It's just to figure out what's your equilibrium. Like where do you draw that line? How do you balance it? And like, where do you then, you know, stop your phone? Like at what time? Or is it in the living room? You don't let it go in the bedroom or whatever it is. But uh, it's... um, I feel um, technology is the reason why we're all having this like uh, work, whatever work we are able to do now, it's all digital. So it's really surprising how, you know, um, we have already been at the cusp of like this uh, digital advancement, like last year and like all the last uh, few years. But then suddenly 2020, you know, it, we, like, it was almost like people were pushed to the edge that, hey, use this. You know, there has been like Skype forever, like since 20 years, I know, but nobody really bothered about really using it. Right. So suddenly it was like the age of Zoom, like in one second, people just adapted. And I think that has been quite a a study in itself that how we are so adaptive to like things and to move on and to like really grasp things when it's happening. So, um, yeah, I mean, that is going to be. Uh, like this, I feel. Uh, but I hope like there can be NGMA sessions <laughs> in the future. Or... Koilika, do you have a different point of view? No, I just think, well, you know, I was connecting with you two days ago and, you know, I was I was in a place where I was for a week and a half with no Wi-Fi. So, you know, my love for technology has a limit to it. In fact, I don't know how many of you will agree to this, but um, Ashish will have an opinion on this, but, you know, Clients often ask you to do 3Ds. It's become this obsessive thing that show us 3Ds. And I detest them, right? Because design evolves. And even as designers, we, things evolve as you learn more about the client, you move through the space, things change. And now with so much technology available, not only are we doing 3Ds and with COVID, we're having to do walkthroughs and I'm just going mad because I'm thinking to myself, wait, you know, I'm not there as yet and I'm having to show the client before we even start completely, you know, what I'm going to hand over. And, it, and you know, art, light, they are, they, the artifacts you use, that's what creates the, the emotion of the space. That's what gives the space a soul and personality. So 
of course we are adapting you know and thank god for skype and zoom and otherwise you know i, I mean i i won't be able to afford this pandemic very frankly i mean you know one is still establishing a brand k2 india is still young we only, we were, we were to, meant to celebrate this october 10 years of k2 india and uh, but if it wasn't for technology we frankly wouldn't survive you know we'd have to lay off a lot of people in touch would we haven't had to we haven't had to go there um so in a way one one has this you know uh, love hate relationship with technology because the you know the love relationship is okay we're managing to work and the hate relationship is sometimes that line over when is when is work over and when you know when is time for yourself is is a bit tricky but like ashish you know we ran back to office the minute covid you know the the lockdown lifted we were like okay you know what we heading back we taking all the precautions all the thermometers spray guns whatever you know <laughs> everything and we ran back and started opening we opened with smaller numbers because we had people working for us living all over from bhopal to bombay to you know to cal to all to to everywhere and so we didn't call them back but we started so so yeah i have a love hate relationship with technology yeah but isn't that isn't there a sense that you know there's a frontier being opened up that even though we were you know uh, earlier of course there was technology was always there that now you can do a lot more because business is a lot more global and you could really be working with somebody in any part of the world i mean especially akanksha for you you were doing yeah. all of this and you were having to travel but now you're able to do it remotely like so isn't but there a know, sense of things a sense of little bit of sense of freedom also from that but you know parna i i'm sorry i'm butting in but i have to say you know the time like for doing especially when one is doing at least for me when one is doing projects out of town what you do and what you at least for me the learning of in that travel even in that car driving down to that site what you see on like ashish was talking about you know being in delhi and picking up stuff on the road on the way to the raw mango uh, you know farmhouse that disappears right that thought process disappears because if if she's going to beautiful places in thailand there's so much else going on in that drive to her final destination destination that journey disappears in technology for me you know yeah i mean right. but that that what kind of starts off a different thought process in my mind which sometimes makes me change my entire design by the way right i mean i, I walk into the sign i'm no i'm not doing this we completely resampling it i'm sorry i'm being obnoxious but that's what we're going to do so for me that disappears with technology but you know i think i think but i know enough architects who love it absolutely love it they're sitting at home designing everything and and they feel they're going to open these three different offices and they never need to go and meet their clients so <laughs> okay um so let's just have one more question on what the future holds before we move over to our audience q and a so you want to start with that koilika and then we can move on to the other the future holds well you know a conscious been saying and i think the the faster we adapt because covid is not going away and i don't know you know you start as reading an article uh, 3 days ago that with everything that's going in by 2025 india would not be considered a developing country anymore because of our uh, because of the increased level in unemployment so there is i i am i don't know what the future holds you know one is just actually um trying literally trying to a survive and be innovative because i i mean i at least had an awakening about what are we doing you know what am i doing what am i doing here is this my sole purpose you know ashish talks about meditation but i've i've actually also been on this thing about this really you know uh, maybe it also had to do with something with me hitting 40 last december and you know entering covid at 40 and usually people say oh your whole life changes around and i'm like well it's changed around but not <laughs> what i expected <laughs> so i don't know what the future holds but akanksha is absolutely right you know all of us ashish and i are going to have to get onto a bang wagon of you know getting more acquainted with and used to technology and thank god for the interns in my office because they are so super good with it i mean they are teaching me stuff I, i i don't know how many of them are watching but i don't want them to know this but actually i learn a hell of a lot from them so. yeah the the gen z's are killing it like they're on to another level of uh, deciphering and expressing themselves through online platforms it's uh, yeah. Yeah. um so what so what's the future akanksha uh you know the future um you know i was discussing this with a friend and she's a curator she's a 
she is polish i think but she's living in berlin and she just curated uh, an an exhibition that's opening uh, matilda and in uh, zurich in like museum of gestaltung and we were talking about how you know even art like viewing art has changed like walk throughs digital walk throughs and like there's no uh, importance of like you know your products being displayed in a space so we were discussing and then she said something really uh, meaningful and she's like you know one thing that we're all doing is we're trying to be we're trying to find empathy online we're trying to be empathetic we're trying to learn to be empathetic online which we i guess have not done before uh, because we weren't so pushed to the limits to be so intimate with it and um, so the future i mean it's going to be a technology of course it's only going to increase but i think we will try to find a way where we can um you know find that connection i think that's one aspect of it but um uh, the future is very yeah like sorry to say a bit uncertain like you know that's what it is uh but like kolka also said like we're trying to survive and like also inspire ourselves each day it's very difficult for me as a creator every day i have to like really push myself like you know find some inspiration just sitting inside the home i've not been out like the air is so bad like i can't even go for a walk in delhi so um you really go within like more than going outwards i've really gone within this year and i think that's a same for a lot more people to really reflect and introspect inside uh like also ashish's practice so yeah mm. and ashish you want to share your views so i mean i'm going to take cues from both of them and you know um i'll start what i i'm going to start from where akanksha stopped and you know i think future is definitely looking inside and it's it's kind of understanding your own language for me um trying to find a uh, meaning through a definition through what i do already um and honing that and this is a very personal um personal motive in terms of finding language and finding um finding meaning in what we do because i think what one thing covid has taught us it is that whatever is important to you is that's all matters you know i i think everything else is noise and we get to learn to cut the noise out of our systems um because there be, there are so many influences technology has given us so much um it's not 1980 where we had to literally step into a library to find inspiration today inspiration is available on multiple apps multiple platforms but what is it that is us what is it that is me what is it that is my language what is my the um, my ethos uh, and that's where i see not only in the, as a design practice also as a self um, as a self uh, as a human how do i start looking at myself more independently and more uh, more uh, more in a way where where kanch said as woke right so we all are kind of trying to find new meanings and we all become more aware of what is right and what is wrong i mean i think we've never the world has never seen so many ideas of identity be it gender be it color all of that being being so more, more appreciated you know like people are being more open to things but that also comes for the identity of looking at within yourself and then coming with that opinion so a is one is me as person and one is my practice so i think for me the future is definitely going even more inward than i have been before well i think that's a very positive outcome to have from the covid and and that's actually a very positive way to look at it also so so that's nice thank you um let's move on to questions we've got quite a few so i think just d- dive in there if something really matters to you uh what are some uh, anubhuti angshuman says what are some potential design concepts that will be in high demand in the future that's a very open question is there sorry can you repeat it what are some potential design concepts that will be in high demand in the future uh, like that well i mean one of the most obvious thing is to to make your home your office or like make your home like your sanctuary and like your sacred space so those are the design i mean yeah we're doing potentially everything at home right now so home as a sanctuary will be a direction that already you know 
is is happening and it's going to go on um, actually sorry i'm going to button there but i i feel like the opposite i think that i think what i'm going to look at is more outdoor spaces now like i want mm-hmm. to see more outdoor furniture more garden like i every time i open a magazine the first thing i look is at gardens i look at outdoor furniture because i don't know why it's my natural thing to because being a kangshu i've been locked in one room suddenly you just want to see like what's the world outside you know like there is mm-hmm. that 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 feeling of space that i miss so for me i think uh i feel the next trend for me is outdoor spaces like i just want to see more and more and live outside yeah and and it's going to coexist all these yeah. uh, things and it has to coexist um exactly um, no but ikea must have revamped its emphasis on home also right substantially through the pandemic right akanksha uh of course i mean uh, you know ikea is all about life at home so yeah. uh they are in a business which has actually uh, only gotten better during this time because you know people are now suddenly uh 24/7 at home so now they are like buying furniture left right and center uh and and um but we are like rethinking concepts like you know now so many people already exercised at home and like so many people uh you know like how koelika was also saying like having a private space to do something or your meditative practice or like a single mother with two kids she wants a time out like you know how can she divide her space and get some privacy that she mm. needs when she cannot go out so i think uh looking at your space and dividing it into compartments and activity areas and to find and to also uh, make it functional that you can also do other activities like fitness for example how can how can your home encourage you to remain fit when you can't go out like in cities like delhi like i can't even go out like if i even wanted to uh, so public spaces here as of the time being it's like irrelevant like it's uh, you know um so uh, yeah i mean it's it will be it's um, yeah mm. Okay uh Vishak Ranotra asks what is the timeline for a product like furniture or lighting to come into production and sales from the time of conception and that's for you Akansha Oh uh can you uh, repeat the, uh, that again what is the, what timeline, is the timeline for yeah. a product like furniture or lighting to come into production and sales from the time of conception from the time of- um yeah two years like yeah. uh like there's a concept phase design phase ideation phase and then of course it's like distribution and marketing and sales so it's uh, from the time you think of something till the time it lands in the store it takes 2 years so whatever i'm designing right now it's going to come out in like 2022 i don't even know if i'll be there so it's like it's quite uh, mind screwing sometimes because you get confused with years so right now i'm already working with 2023 colors I mean, 2023. Like right now, we're in like this existential crisis. But like, I'm designing for 2023, so it's like <laughs> quite uh, quite funny in a way. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, so Sushmita Rai asks Ashisha, could you please talk a little bit about how you develop a concept for an interior project? How do you imagine volume? Is there any process that you follow to subtract or to add volume? keeping in yeah. mind the spatial program so well, that's a very interesting question and i think uh, um i'm actually the worst person to be asked this question because i don't work on 3d computer software it's like i draw i still hand sketch everything so for me um what i usually do is i create an empty volumetric box and i love drawing and i paint a lot i actually hand paint the whole space physically like they used to do in the olden times archaic times um uh and um and then i start kind of addition subtraction so if you see my practice is all about addition subtraction multiplication division like the basic design concept that you learn in the first year of architecture school is what i still practice on daily basis so for me i always use cutouts i use puzzles i use a lot of uh, i have these toys that i use which are bauhaus toys which you can find online as well which i pick up from the berlin bauhaus museum and their forms in different colors and i always place them and that that gives me a great idea of volumetrics in a space 
and that's how i actually usually design as um because i like tactility so for me that's the way i design but i also like after that i obviously the office uh, draws it out for me on the computer and then the 3d's happen and that's when i again re enter the design phase and start seeing proportions and scale of objects you know and what i like to do usually is something if them is really small generically i like to scale it up and be alice in wonderland for that moment and kind of see how that can uh, that reacts to the space around and sometimes that works out very well for me okay thank you um this is a question for all the panelists interesting question all of you create something tangible something or that some space that people inhabit or possess how do you detach from what you have made and when do you say yes it's complete because creating is about flow and reaching a point of meditation how do you reach a point of yes this project now is complete um should i take that yeah sure so i don't think for me um our projects are actually ever complete i think i think i think i at least i the way i approach it i create spaces which evolve with the person who's going to inhabit it um i think there comes a point when you say okay we're ready to hand over this project is um uh, you know i mean i i don't know i think a lot of us have gone and looked at projects and and turned around and said i mean i could re you know so so i do something called a take part in something called as india design in delhi uh, every year after year and we have the same space the exact same space year after year and every year we completely change the feel the look the color of the space around including the entire furniture line and i think that at least i as an architect and designer could say i could go into the same space and um even 5 days later do a completely different design to it so i think spaces are complete when you know you got a synergy with what your client wanted and how you have explained that in the aesthetic of the space for me it's complete but i think spaces i think the, the most beautiful space in the timeless spaces are those which continue evolving and changing uh, you know with once it they, once they are in use okay that's nice so there there is an element of flow to it in the sense that your the flow of energy is moving from you to the client so to speak um i think we have time for uh, one or two more responses if anybody wants to respond to that um uh, yeah i mean uh, i think i liked what koilika said actually it's uh, it's yeah it doesn't end i think the journey and um especially i mean for for collections and for products that i design of course i'm designing in the future but like so for example what i designed in 2018 is coming out now so of course sometimes there is a detachment in the middle but then it comes back because now it's in the market what i was thinking about 2 years ago uh but but it's uh, it's quite interesting to see the journey even after it comes to the store and how customers interpret those products they are kind of you know uh, shaping the narrative uh again like all over again like what you thought in your head uh is not the end of that product or that story it's in fact like just the beginning and how it's quite interesting to see how people interpret those products and stories and how they mix and match it in their homes and suddenly you know you get a new perspective over the same thing that you designed like you you wouldn't have been able to think like that like you know say a person has kind of uh, reinterpreted your design placed it in a context which you didn't think of so it's it's quite interesting to see how it evolves over time and it gains new uh, narratives thank you so um aparna can i can i say something yeah sure so um my object practice um is very kind of different in that sense because for me it's all about being minimal right less is really 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 important for us because the edit of what is too much it's what makes my practice um so actually the the end is when we start reducing the the elements from a product and where we come to saying that okay if you remove one more thing from this product it's not going to remain design it's going to be just a lump of something that's on the floor you know so that is 
so for me it becomes the it goes the other direction so where we are trying to it's an element of reduction rather than saying that okay we've added enough now let's stop for me it's like have we reduced enough to say it stops so for me that's a flip in a in a in a way in terms of um uh, saying that how do we detach from our product and saying now it's it's ready for us to say okay it's oh, it's re- it's over okay yeah so you are known for the wabi sabi way of working also. yeah i i find that extremely extremely intriguing yeah. yeah so there's a nice to see that there's a philosophy that kind of undermines that or uh, yeah. underpins that yeah okay great so i guess i'll leave it to asad to summarize or to say thanks Well, thank you uh, to our panelists for sharing your projects, your vision, the future of design, Aparna, for so skillfully moderating the session. I mean, I, I wish we had more time. I mean, I just loved all your presentation. I, have, I personally have so many questions. In fact, what is that color for twenty twenty two? But we'll we'll get to that. I mean, thank you for suggesting the NGMA as a venue. I mean, I you know I would have rather had the session at the NGMA, CSMBS. or even the opera house and you know then we could have all gone and had a drink at kalagora cafe uh but the truth is the future of events like this is going to be a mix of online and offline um uh and uh, there are pros and cons in both of them and you know akanksha mentioned the miro board we had done a, a wonderful collaboration with six visual artists in, in october based on the miro board which was kind of intriguing six visual artists created work based on their collaboration through a miro board but um, that's the time we live in it's very exciting and you know you all guys have just been this this conversation i wish we had more time again but a special thank you to our partners the kalagora association brinda miller for collaborating with us and to the participants who uh, you know joined us and shared such wonderful questions uh, thank you for being part of our week uh week not just a fortnight dedicated to collaboration um of uh, our next session in this our next live session in this uh, series is on technology and the future of theater with roshan abbas and sheena khalid on the 28th of november we have many more uh, avid online videos as part of this uh, uh uh fortnight of uh of programming so do stay tuned uh stalk us on social media or check out our website until then stay safe you know remember that learning never stops thank you so much guys it's been such a wonderful session